produced by Ranting Rhino Productions. Praxis Pedagogy exists to position our teaching and learning practice within different methodologies. We want to construct a guild of educators dedicated to designing a difference in our own teaching and learning and in our students' experience. Welcome back to episode 63 of Praxis Pedagogy Podcast. In this episode, we're talking about chapter one in an incredible book called Appreciative Inquiry in Higher Education, A Transformative Force. This is the second edition by authors Jeannie Cockle and Joan MacArthur Blair. We take each chapter of this book, we break it down, we see what uh, resonates with us, we see where the applications might be, can be, should be, and we talk about what could be as we move forward in our exploration of using appreciative inquiry in our own practices. So stay tuned. Thank you for joining us. We'll catch you on the other side. Three, two, one. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Practice Pedagogy Podcast, where we are working to center our practice with solid pedagogy and to build a, a guild, say that five times fast, build a guild of educators dedicated to designing a difference in the student experience. That's my new tagline for the podcast. Right? Ooh, that's <laughs> quite the tagline. I like cool. it. I <laughs> that all by myself. Yeah. It took me, only took me eight months. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Ladies. How you doing? It's been a while. All righty. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. It has. And I'm, I'm glad that we're coming back in, in a way and talking, um, you know, talking about this book. Because if I needed to read a book in the last yeah. few weeks, this is the book that I needed to, <laughs> I needed to look at. So, uh, yeah. yeah. I don't think you're alone in that, yeah. uh, in that, in that sentiment. So the book we're talking about everybody is called Appreciative Inquiry in Higher Education. It is uh, co-written by Jeannie Cockwell and Joan MacArthur Blair. Hope I said that right. And uh, it is the second edition, 2020. I have the hardcover. Mm -hmm. Me too. I don't know if anybody buys paperback anymore. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'll just add to this that, that Joan MacArthur Blair and Jeannie put this book out earlier, well, in 2020. And I saw it, I believe, on Twitter. And there was something there that the first hundred people would get an e copy free charge. So I was on it straight away, got that e copy, and I got two chapters into it. And I'm like, I need the hard copy of this book. This is not a book that I'm only going to read once. So no. I, went, I went back and I got the real thing. Yeah. I, I, I like the hard in your face books like this because I got to write in it. I got to highlight. I got to circle. I got to make notes. Um, yeah. I'm not a big ebook reader. Mm -mm. So yeah, do you read ebooks or do you read? No, like I'm not. And I, you would think so because I'm very young, but I just read that in right? at least one, at least one. I'm not, I'm not anymore. I can't say that. Hilarious. But no, I actually like, um, I'm the same. I like hardback books, probably get it from, um, yeah, just growing up with lots of books. But um, I think this book, particularly if we were in normal times of actually leaving our home, um, it's the one that you need to carry around, you know, and the one that you need to pull out and and remind people of, um, you know, when they're, when they're going through different situations at work and need to work through ideas and problems and find that, that, that innovation. So I definitely feel that this is a hard copy book. It has to be oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. There's a few books that I have that are, I've gone back to and referred to a lot. And, um, the other one is design thinking in higher ed. That is, um, that's a book I've gone back to three or four times. Go figure. Right. But, um, when did you first bump into appreciative inquiry? Well, for me, I think, I think for me, oh, can I start, Sally? Do you mind? Because you'll be way more philosophical than I will be. Um, I, uh, That's a bit of a high bench. Well, you, I know. So you better start thinking. Um, no, I am. Um, 
it was funny because I was first introduced to the model officially when I was taking my MED. And, um, and I was like, oh, like, you know, I've been doing a lot of this type of work. This is actually how I like to live my life, you know, like I, and you, you know, I, um, and there's an actual framework to this that, you know, there's an actual structure to this way of thinking. Um, and, um, and so I kind of then through my masters actually was given the time to reflect on some of these practices where I'd maybe brought in some of these techniques and, and then, you know, refocused on what, you know, what if I'd have actually, you know, brought in, um, brought in this model and led a team through my ideas rather than it just being a singular thing that was done. Like what, you know, I was trying to express to people in my team or people in senior management, my ideas and, and the direction that I wanted to go in. And I think if I'd have taken them through this structure alongside me, that they might've been more on board with the process. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that's when I was first, um, formally introduced to it. And so, um, and I, I think that I'd been, I, I had been to meetings and been to kind of strategy, um, committees where we were taken through this process, but we didn't really understand it. We didn't really understand mm -hmm. the process. We were just, we were just taken through the framework. And I think you need to understand both. You need to understand what the concept of AI is and, and why we're going through this process because we want to build greater things from the problem. We don't just want to focus on that problem. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that was kind of my, my first introduction to it formally. And Sally. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting question because I don't yeah. think I've been formally introduced to the, the model until now. So when I think about, you know, the, my MED was a bit before Lucy, cause obviously Lucy's so young, which she just happened to mention. Um, but, uh, and I mean, you know, going through similar change, change management or wh whatever we want to call those models. So I've been introduced to many along the way, but what I found so interesting with this and actually delving right into it. And like you say, really thinking about this as a concept, but also this, you know, the very deliberate framework there. And I realized that, you know, when I started the project back in, in Trinidad, back in 2014 and my colleague, yeah, just drop that one into my colleague, Leslie Osborne from VIU. When I think about the approach that we took there and uh, Donna Scoo Moses was the other, on the other side of this experience. When I read through this framework and I think about the approach that we took, you know, we co collaborated with the team in Trinidad and, and it mirrors this. But for me, it's been a practice that I realize now that I could have actually enhanced. I've got a lot to learn from this, but when it really resonated for me was, um, I think getting to know Tim's ideas around design thinking. And I've been very fortunate that in 2020, I was involved in a couple of sessions that Tim actually led on design thinking. And so as soon as uh, this book, you know, I started reading this book, I could see the overlap there and I could see the different language and really thinking about the language that more suits the situation. So I think having design thinking in your toolkit along with appreciative inquiry, that's a very, very, you know, a good starting place. Yeah, I totally agree. I was first introduced to it like Lucy in my master's degree soon found out it's, it's a framework that I've been using for my whole life. Cause it's, it's just a, it's a mindset that I have that I tend to focus more on the positive than the negative. Although in, in the circles that we run in uh, the TVET world, we often tend to focus in on the things that aren't working really well because we want to fix them. Right. And so there's this tendency to, to focus in on what's not working really well because we want to we want to bring it up. We want to fix it. Um, it fits also into the mindset that I have around strengths based leadership, strength based coaching. And I'm, I've always been a, um, a subscriber to the idea of find out what you're really good at, what your where your strengths are, and then double, triple down on that. Don't. Don't spend a lot of time working on deficiencies unless, of course, they're, they're, you know, serious deficiencies. But, 
you know, if, if, if you're doing pretty well in a lot of different areas in your leadership and in your craft of, of uh, being an educator, but you know that there are some several strengths that, that you just gravitate to that become so natural to you that you, you just kind of do it in that Wayne Gretzky mode where you're just not even thinking about it and it's just happening. That's where you need to double, triple down in. And so doing the action research in my master's degree, coming alongside of the appreciative inquiry, I'm like, oh, this makes total sense to me. And it fit the the open systems model that we were being exposed to through Peter Senge and um, the fifth discipline and all that stuff. And then to let the cat out of the bag, Lucy, remember you asked me a little while ago, like what, what framework yeah. do I use when I do a sprint yeah. with, you know, a, a bunch yeah. of trades people, this is, this is it. And, and I'm, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do this uh, more often because this is the second time ladies where I've read a book and went or been doing a method and thought, Hmm, I wonder if, I wonder if it would work in my context. And so I rejig the whole thing to fit into my context. And then a year <laughs> or two later, somebody comes out with a stinking book. <laughs> uh, I'm just like, I'm a year or two behind the punch on those ones. But anyway, you know, I was just going to hop in there and say that I first met now, this is really Lucy was probably just in kindergarten then, but yeah, yeah, definitely. I first met um, Joe MacArthur Blair 20 years ago when I took my PIDP. And this, it was the first night. So there I was. I was sort of fairly new immigrant to Canada. So that was all new. I'd started teaching just on a, you know, an on-call basis at what was Malaspina University College at that time. And somebody said, yeah, well, if you're interested in teaching, you need to get the PIDP. And um, so drove up to Courtney first night in the classroom there, absolutely, you know, terrified, didn't understand a word that was going on and who should be the instructor, but Joe MacArthur Blair and sort of, you know, we know what happens to students when they're terrified. There's very little that they hear. There's very little that they they don't contribute anything because they're so fear based at that time. But within hours, Jo MacArthur Blair told this story um, about her work. And I believe it was in Bangladesh. I believe it was in Bangladesh. I guess a long time ago, or maybe it was Pakistan, should really get this figured out. And she said, one of the things is with international work, the tendency is for people to go in there and tell everybody what they've do they're doing wrong. So she was visiting factories where there were children working. And the, you know, she said, what's happened in the past is, is aid workers come in and they shut the factories down because they're all child labor. And what she actually said was that's the worst thing that can happen because now the families have no income. And so she said what the, her work had been, she'd worked with the, the, you know, the managers in the factory, the owners of the factory and negotiated that the children only worked. It was something like the children now only work for six hours and they got three hours of schooling as well. So she met this balance and that was, that was pivotal for me, but that was her approach in the classroom as well. So it's almost like she didn't talk about appreciative inquiry at all in that whole session, but she lived it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the key, right? If, if you can, if you can bake it right into your ethos, um, people don't even know what, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, and, and they just, they just have a really great experience in it. And so I think it's, I think it's important for us, for our listeners to kind of put some definition around appreciative inquiry and, and AI. Cause when we say AI, we're, we're not talking we? about artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> no, in this in this yeah. uh in this surveillance world we want to stay away from that acronym as much as we can i think but um, i was gonna say tim i come from a farming background it's even worse <laughs> if you use that um acronym Ooh, yes yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> ironically we have a bunch of 4-h people in our family so you know yes. i know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and all i'm gonna say is glove up that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all the way up to the shoulder <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And who wants that job anyway? Right. Like yeah. who's going to, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need to do that. Um, 
<laughs> so an- another interesting character in the area of appreciative inquiry is Gervais Bush. He is a professor at SFU. Uh, I've read a bunch of his stuff. I've got a bunch of his books. One great book that he wrote that was instrumental to me was Clear Leadership. And uh, so I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes uh, for that. But he says this about a, appreciative inquiry. He says, AI revolutionized the field of organization development and was a precursor to the rise of positive organization studies and the strengths-based movement in American management. So from a, from a leadership lens, he has a really strong positive thing to say about it. Now, if we go back in history a little bit, David Cooper writer and Suresh Srivasta, if I I probably brutalized that last name are considered the forerunners of the process. And so I ran into David Cooper writer in my, in my master's program. I got a lunch, a a lunch. I got a lot of his (laughs) articles um, and they're great. They're fantastic. And I'll even throw a couple of those in the, in the episode show notes here. But um, David Cooper writer says this about AI. He says it's, it's co-constructed. It's co-constructed practice informed by all those who work on creating the conditions for growth and change. And I think, I think if you're a collaborative person, the whole idea of appreciative inquiry really resonates. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Like, um, and I wanted to pick up on one thing that you said before I link into that. And when you talked about uh, being a tradesperson and wanting to fix it, that is the mindset of AI. That is the mindset of, we're not we're not sitting there all day dwelling on the fact that the tire is flat or <laughs> or that the 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 thing blew up you know we're not we're not thinking about that i mean yeah we're we're wondering why that happened but um but we're looking at a solution to make sure it doesn't happen again and we're trying to solve the problem um in a way that would make this system work better so we from system thinkers in trades i think this model does resonate really well for that and the other aspect of you know what you just touched on there was you know appreciative inquiry to t- take someone through that phase and this is what you did when you and I officially um, met um, when we did our sprint work pre-COVID um, was the appreciative coaching aspect and you just touched on that and and I think that in order to um, facilitate this model well and and um, really bring in everybody's ideas to, you know, to foster innovation, you need to make sure that you do bring in that, that appreciative coast coaching aspect. So, um, so yeah, so I agree with, you know, with everything that you said, and um, you can only do that. And what, you know, what Sally just said too, about, you know, being in a fear-based environment, you can't have that when you're trying to work through, you know, a model like this. Um, Not that, they were working through that model, but just understanding kind of how you kind of build up on an idea, create destiny, create desire, you know, make sure that you, you, you can work together in, in a safe space to allow for these ideas to flow. Then that coaching really does come into it. So I, you know, I think this is a great model for people in, not just in, you know, in, in post-secondary, but people that teach um, within the trade sector in post-secondary um, and also in industry as well. And um, I think it's a, a really great tool to use, um, you know, once once you're out in industry. So there's lots of different processes that come into it. I mean, you know, the book reminds us of the four Ds and, you know, that, that flashed me back to my master's when I was <laughs> trying to work through different processes through that. But it, it does. And I just, the only thing for me is that I, I get it. And a lot of my small knit of people that I work with absolutely get this way of thinking but I don't know I think the institutions may need to be reminded of this way of of moving forward and understanding um you know the vision of the institution so um I I would also like to unravel that a little bit today too in trying to see how you can get everyone on board (laughs) um it's interesting that you should say that though Lucy because some of us that maybe have read a little bit more into this book, um, been with it for a while, there's a section in there that speaks to the fact that when you look at, um, you know, leadership in a post-secondary institution, there's, 
typically, um, and I'm not thinking of trades so much because trades, we go out into industry, but a lot of academics have spent all of their lives in the university, in the educational sector. Um, and one of the things is that, that the authors speak about is what great problem thinkers they are. That's what's made them very good academics. But they treat, you know, t- taking that lens and looking, focusing on those problems, and uh, which is really sort of, uh, you know, mirroring what you just said there, Lucy. So sort of identifying that if you take that approach to leadership, you're just digging away at the whole problems in the organization, which um, is obviously completely opposite than growing and dreaming. And, and like you say, thinking about that destiny and, and then designing so to reach it. And it's almost like you can see both playing out and in it's, and, and they talk about, you know, what does it feel like when you're really alive? And I love that coach basing approach to that because just, uh, you know, as a group, we often will get a conversation just going on, you know, just on text and we just like fire away. Somebody will say something and that spark will hit. And then for the next, I don't know, 20, maybe sometimes even 40 minutes. And so there's so many things that you notice, like this is what it looks like when you really have no limitations around you because the, the, there's no fear. You, we're encouraging each other. We're encouraging each other's ideas. And so it is, yeah, recognizing when that's happening. And I guess recognizing when it's not happening. Yeah, that's a good point. And so if I, if I bring us back to the book for just a few seconds, 13 chapters in the book and um, the trajectory of the series of the, uh, of the podcast will be to focus in on, on a chapter. Uh, as we as we move through, so uh, for those of you listening, uh, we'll be doing the reading. We'll be bringing you the uh, the Lucy's Cole's note version, and uh, and then Sally and I will uh, will jump in and add in as we go. But uh, you, you've already heard that there's a 4D framework that comes along with appreciative inquiry. It's discovery, dream, design, and destiny. And so if those of you who are not familiar with appreciative inquiry, that's the framework that they have you go through. And underlying all of that framework is the idea of, okay, so this is what's happening. What would make it better? Uh, or if everything's going great, what would take it to the next level? Um, or, okay, so this isn't working, but what's working well, even though this thing isn't working. And so, um, when we look at the, at, the, at the name of this framework, Appreciative Inquiry, it's questions based around the positivity piece of what's going on, even though in the, in the system, it could all be just falling apart and burning to the ground, which, you know, we've talked a lot about in this podcast anyway. So, you know, it's burning to the ground. That might be a good thing. Um, so 13 chapters. And today we were ambitious to try and knock off two chapters. I don't think we're going to be able to do that. So let's just focus in on the introduction um, in appreciative inquiry. And uh, so let me ask you this question in the chapter. Let's do a high flyby of the chapter first. What stuck out to you in this, in this particular chapter? Oh, silence. This is where the elevator music gets in. Yeah, yeah, that's right. (laughs) This will be where Tim will play some of that really loud, you know, heavy rock music and everybody will screech to a halt as they're driving along. They rip their earphones Mm -hmm. out because it's like, wow, that's too loud. I I have to say that, you know, because like I I said before, I hadn't really dug into this design in, in a serious way in the past. I knew it existed. I liked the sound of it. But to actually read up on this framework, that was new to me. And there was a point in there where I began to, especially around the, the questions, the questions that they pose up front, you know, what gives life? I mean, I love this. What gives life, you know, that discovery piece, um, what might be so dream, dream about what you really want. And, and, and I just, that was so refreshing to me to think this is what we do with our children. Why do we not do it with, you know, adults and then what can be so that design, I liked that. And 
obviously the destiny. And of course, thinking about the design model, I love that whole piece of in the design thinking model where they talk about the prototype. So you've, you know, you've designed it, you prototype it, you reflect on it. But there was a part of me that was a tad nervous at the, this point because they had not spoken about the problems. And I've been in those situations. I've been in, um, in, in departments where they've gone through mediation and, and the problem, it's like, it is the white, you know, it's the elephant in the room. So we're all talking about all these nice things, but nobody's talking about the problems. And I was very, oh, I was thinking, oh gosh, they're going into terms like hope and magic and, and things like that. And there, there it was, they actually bring it in there. We're not ignoring the problem. Mm -hmm. We do not ignore the problem. We're just really delving into when things are working well, what's at the core of these. And so that was the, yeah, that really hooked me in there. And I was so, so relieved to see that because otherwise, um, you know, that whole thing of sailing above the problem, but the problem's still there eroding and yeah, <laughs> you know, decaying away at the roots. I, I think that I think like from, um, yeah, like what you said about the, you know, going through these designs and the hope and the magic, like, oh, I love all that stuff. Like it's just, uh, it, that's what gets me excited about my job and, um, and, and, and the people that I work with and what I do. And, and particularly, even though this book was pre COVID, there are so many things that I felt like I needed to read now post COVID. Um, you know, like if the institution's going through, you know, a, a, you know, a change, like a big transition, it's not necessarily like, you know, all new leadership or, or, or anything like that, but we're going through a massive transition. And it talked about how, you know, the core of the conversation when it comes to you know, change is, is the roles that the three of us work in. It's teaching, learning, research, and innovation. And that got me really excited because at a time when you feel you have no control, um, it actually reminded me that actually we do have control and the positions that we in right now, we need to really focus on what does, you know, and, and I, it made me think like, okay, what part of this framework am I in right now, actually, like in, in my role and, and when it comes to COVID, like where uh, and, and the return to what will be our next phase of how we deliver education. Um, I really liked how, you know, it talked about the, the institution as a community. So um, focusing on the successes of our institution as a learning community, as a community um, within itself, as an industry within itself, like how are we all connected? Like, and, um, and, and uh, what what success, successes should we focus on? And it will lead us to a very different future than focusing on that list of problems. And um, and I needed to read that. And um, and so you know, going through three you know a few different things within um, within my institution right now. Um, I've been tend to be not, not not being Lucy, not being myself. And I was I was focusing too much on the problems. Um, at hand in, in some of the different factors that we were going through and then all of a sudden you know it clicked in like this is not how you build great things you need to focus on um, focus on the possibilities that will stem from this um, and I really um, there are some parts that made me uncomfortable to think about um, how, do, how do I sit with despair how do I sit with forgiveness like that's more through the book. And I, I then realized you do, I, I do tend to concentrate on specific areas of AI, specific areas on the four Ds than other areas. And that was kind of going to be a, a question that I'd like to bring up at some point, not necessarily today, but how do you, how do you structure your time, even though a phase may be super uncomfortable and you kind of just want to flip through that and get to the magic. <laughs> So, uh, so, um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm still working through that. So, um, and full disclosure, you know, Indigo is still has my book in transit. So it was, um, I watched, uh, I know. So I watched, um, Cockles give a presentation on uh, the book. I've read side notes. I've read the first chapter. 
Um, I've uh, Sally sent me some slides that I wanted to delve into, and I read back on some <laughs> of my AI work that I did, yeah. um, you know, back in my masters. And I'm really excited to read this book as one I want to stick into. It's it's like you don't want to you don't want to put it down. You don't say that about a lot of academic books or books that st- structure your thinking. So um, yeah, so this hooked me. This first chapter hooked me. Line and thinker. Yeah. Good. That's good. Let me let me share with some of our listeners some things that um, stuck out to me. I love the provocative proposition section. There's ten provocative questions, or st- I, th- I, I would prefer to call them statements. They're not really questions, and and I would think that they are more along the lines of standard operating procedures. So SOP is like these are the things that you want to think about and practice when you're getting into AI, and all of them are all of them are good. A couple of them that stick out to me are the number seven, where it says leaders practice the skills of leading by utilizing AI to maximize opportunities for their personal growth and institutional momentum. And and that's uh, that's just so powerful. And I, I love the idea that AI is this force, right? As, and it's, it's not, it's not a tool that you leverage the force with, right? It's not something that you come in and you try to pry things open with. It's, it's this force that meets this chaotic, turbulent thing that we call higher ed and to a certain degree nullifies it or calms it down to a point where people can have space to think, to have space to dream, um, and a space mm-hmm. to, uh, reflect. And, and those, those are powerful things. And uh, like even in number six, where it says AI resides as a powerful force inside the other turbulent forces of higher education and, you know, trades, academics, whatever department you're in, there's always going to be turbulence, right? And AI can fit into those turbulent situations, no matter what your discipline is, because the, the, the principles are just that transformative. Um, and just before you carry on to link into that, there was a line that said, um, it's setting the stage to be appreciative. And so when you're talking about that turbulent stage, like you, you have to kind of flick back and say, okay, let's, let's change this up. Like let's set the stage to be appreciative. And yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, interesting to me because it's like it is about how you live it's and somebody said it a minute what one of you said it. it's not like you put on this you know this idea for the day it's not like okay suddenly I'm going to take the um appreciative inquiry framework and approach this it's like the the living model and and when we came up with this idea about you know because we were all texting the other week about our new books and showing photos of our our deliveries from amazon and things like that and we said okay this is what we're going to do and and i remember thinking for a while what would what would it look like you know at the university if we lived within this model of appreciation inquiry throughout every single layer of the university and what it uh, did from that point on was um, realizing how many layers of the university already do live within that model and and like you were saying you know these provocative questions but I agree that they're, they're like statements just even thinking in those statements and and the authors talk about this about you know language shapes our world and it and it does completely but when I think about all of these layers, there's also a piece where they talk about then suddenly, you know, with I don't know whether they talk about students, but I know uh, our institution, there are a lot of rules that are presented to new students. And so they get this sort of in their welcome thing, they might get an hour and a half of what not to do while you're here at the institution. And um And when I think about it, you know, we have this wonderful thriving in action um, initiative going on at VIU at this time. And really to bring students in and talk to them about like setting that environment, you know, creating that platform where students come into the fact that they're going to be 
appreciate we're going to dig down, find your strengths and, and create that platform to grow, not things about rules about attendance. And, you know, it just seems seems like we do so well at so many layers and then students don't necessarily get that first. Yeah. And that's, that's a really good point you make. And, and then, you know, we do spend too much time orientating our students on what not to do and the rules around all that stuff, but and not enough time on focusing on what they can do and, and, <clears throat> and opening that window just to close off the provocative uh, statements. I like what they say in number five, where it says AI is instrumental in critical processes of working across difference and power and diversity. Yeah, appreciative inquiry has that ability, if it's used correctly, to neutralize power imbalances to a certain degree. They never go away. And, and we don't want to be naive enough to think that if you're sitting in, your, in the room with your dean or your associate vice president academic, that you know, if somebody's going to use AI, that all that stuff's gone not going to happen. However, if used correctly, it, it begins to neutralize the the large disparity of that and, and tries to level the playing field, which I really like. I really like that ability to, to level the playing field so that everyone feels comfortable enough to talk, knowing that it's, it's just, a, it's just a dialogue for now. And, and the way that we build narrative into that is super powerful because you, you can't, you can't and you shouldn't argue somebody else's narrative to a certain degree because it's what they're experiencing and it's what they're employing into, into their process. Um, and just, just to add on to that, I don't want to hog the conversation, but just to add on to that, I love the emergent design piece to all of this. And they actually talk about it at the end of the, at the end of the chapter where they say appreciative inquiry is a framework within which as people engage the inputs and the outcomes evolve. And that's, and for me, whenever I've used this methodology in meetings or in sprints, or when I'm trying to, to build bridges of, of collaborative trust between groups of people, the people engagement in that process is critical. And here's the thing, what I've learned is that even if they're not talking, they're still engaging. I've, I've come to appreciate that not everybody needs to say any, anything that there are going to be a few people in the crowd that just, they just want to sit back, listen and process. And it reminds me, Lucy and, and Sally, I don't know if you remember, but when we did that, that uh, sprint with the hairstylists at VCC, I can't remember her name, but she was, she was one of those people where she didn't want to answer questions. She didn't, she didn't want to engage in the typical way that we would look at engagement, but she was fully locked in. Oh my goodness. Right. Yes. She, and, she got every single layer of what was going oh, on. Totally. And, and you saw that in her feedback, like mm -hmm. when she communicated. Yeah. Just thinking that. yeah. Yeah. Really, really valid point. And I think that I remember somebody saying years ago, um, you know, in a classroom, you might have five students that are responding and talking but everybody is thinking something. Everybody has thoughts about this or an opinion about it. And I think just shifting gears very, very slightly here, that is the joy of true online learning, asynchronous learning, because you provide a space for every single student's voice. And once you open up those, um, you know, those opportunities there where you say, okay, you can you can write a paper, you can give me an audio, you can give me an audio video. Like mm -hmm. once you get, uh, open that up, then yeah. suddenly you hear these different voices. And of course, they're not, they're not fighting for space either, are they? This is one of the things about the traditional classroom. Like we've all been through masters and you've got like 20 odd, you know, budding minds in that classroom, everybody wanting to get the best experience experience they can out of their two years in that program. And there isn't enough time and space, but the online environment does provide that. Yeah. And that, that's why I was thinking the same thing, Sally. And that's why, you know, this, this um, framework or this way of thinking can be used in, in any aspect. And, um, you know, when we talked about online and allowing time for critical thinking, the same thing needs to be done when we're trying to take know a team through a process or you know change the way of thinking you know 
allow people don't just surprise them with this idea and in the book it talks about um it, it, down in i think it was chapter seven six or seven it was creating an appreciative climate and what you talked about um which i'm looking forward to reading and what what you talked about earlier in um we can't just this has to be a culture it has to be a way of designing and i have been to meetings where they're like okay so we're going to do this uh, appreciative inquiry approach to understand and i'm just like no it's not kind of how it works you have to kind of i mean you know that as the facilitator that you're taking this approach um but you don't need to you don't need to like force it upon it's like i'm gonna i'm gonna come in and act like i love you for the day and then i'm just gonna leave and you know it's it, it's it's kind of a very false so you have to be all in and that's why, like, I think that um, creating an appreciative climate, if that's how you're, if that's how you're going to facilitate today's meeting, that's how you need to facilitate all of your meetings. You can't go in with this appreciative approach for this process and then have a completely different approach for the next. And that's why it's a lived, it's a lived thing. And, and those of us that really connect with this is because we've been doing it unintentionally for, you know, for our, our lives in our professional and mm-hmm. our and our private lives um and i no <laughs> and it's not for everybody and that's okay too yeah. yeah yeah it's not a harry potter cloak i mean that's the thing is it's just not the cloak <laughs> and and i have to say uh, yeah, but you all know this person. I'm just going to mention, and, and Jesse's been on the show, but Jesse McGee Chalmers. And it's so interesting when I think about it, the times, you know, just for me, um, he was my, uh, I reported to Jesse for two and a half years there, or maybe even longer. And when I think about it, I was very <laughs> aware that he had created this climate for, you know, for me to grow. And then it's so interesting, isn't it? When then you do come to a book like this and you delve into this framework and you recognize, yes, yeah, if you give people this climate, the culture, and it was consistent, the culture didn't come and go. It, I mean, the cultures don't come and go. That's the thing about culture, isn't it? You live in it every day. But um, yeah, it's interesting as well to have noticed, to reflect back on that. Yeah. And, and he didn't do that. Like, okay, so I've met this person, Sally, and I'm going to take an appreciative inquiry approach to her, you know, um, as I lead her and I leave her team. It's, it's his, it's his culture. We've all felt it in people's presence. I felt it in his presence. Like it's that, that strive that, you know, he lives in. Um, and, and I think that if we look at the people that make us better, if we look at the people around us that enable us to grow, that um you know that they all they all have that kind of culture and that way of thinking um it gives you some tips um at the beginning of the book about um about how you can um come to an agreement through using ai like quick tips and um oh yeah, it's cole's notes um but what i really liked is um you know when i read through those different bullet points um you know i'm like yeah that's why I, I like to do these types of things in my meetings so you know, um, allow space to ask brilliant questions like of each other's work and, um, you know, play and create because don't you find that your best decisions come from the, 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 the discussions you have after the meeting, you know, after that structured meeting, that that's when the best discussions happen. I mean, we always look forward to um, doing conferences because of the, the time we get to spend with like-minded people after the conference, you know, that's, you know, and so that play and create that be with your bubble of energy, like create that bubble of energy. And it's difficult to do that. It's difficult to try it. You have to be all in. That has to be your culture and um, appreciate the differences, which is what Tim was talking about. You know, that, that inclusive piece um, and with our institution, looking at diversity and inclusion, like appreciate our differences. That's not done and deeply listen and um that you know deeply listen that that part is um is that doesn't always happen we don't allow time for that in our one hour zooms we don't allow time for that deep that deep listening and that care that caring for oneself caring for each other like it's just like 
it, yeah, I think great things can happen if just one of these things is done in a meeting, let alone like an abundance of them. Consistently. And you talk about the play things and I have hesitation around, you know, when somebody says that in a leadership role, you know, we're going to make time for play. Don't again, don't tell us and and don't tell us we're going to make time for magic. Let create the climate and let this evolve. And just on that play thing again, because I keep thinking between sort of the macro level of this of senior leadership and the micro level just within the, you know, our collaborative groups. And when I think about that, we do this, we play, like we get these texts, you know, these chains of threads of text messages going. We get GIFs in there. We've got the whole banter going, but great things evolve out of there. And how do you recreate that in those environments where you want to, you want to create that kind of energy and, um, yeah. Let, let me jump in because we got to we got to close this off. And so those are great questions and great action items. And that's something that we want to do with this series within the larger series of the, of the podcast is encourage people with praxis points, points that they can begin integrating into their work, into their life uh, that they can begin building on. Because even if you can't, even if you're not living AI right now, you can grow in it. So here it is. Here's the question. How am I going to build my facilitation techniques to include powerful narrative that will expand dialogue around faculty development? And, and it's intentional in the sense that you're thinking about it, yes, but you're not writing it down on paper. You're not making it an agenda item uh, that it's a bullet point that you check off. But so let me say that question one more time. How am I going to build my facilitation techniques to include powerful narrative that will expand dialogue around faculty development? And that's that's our praxis point for this uh, for this session. And I uh, want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen. And um, we'll uh, we'll catch you on the other side.